CBC is telling you you'll never afford a home. Yeah, we're selling more houses than ever. My name is Andrew Sangler. This is Adam Fife. Welcome to the Keys of Castle podcast, where we discuss what's interesting this week in real estate. We hope that by the end of it, you're going to get some value out of this. If not, we're going to have a lot of fun. That was a good intro, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, that was yeah. actually a lot better. Yeah, yeah, I think a couple, yeah, seven times the term. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk from a pretty high level about uh, housing affordability, which is obviously a massive topic in, in Canada at the moment. And we wanted to break it into two um, uh, two groups, I think, that are the most disaffected by the current policy and structure laid out uh, and, and likely the most at risk. Um, the two being median income earners that are looking to get into their first house or lo looking to get into their first detached house, uh, one of those two brackets. But we also want to have the conversation about the possibility of price reductions and the effect on retirees or semi-retirees, mm -hmm. those looking to transition into retirement, and what the effect would be, obviously, with home prices, if they were to crash, uh, as, as seen in previous examples, there's always winners and losers to that particular situation, and what would that mean uh, for the Canadian economy as a whole? So I think to kick it off, Adam, do you want to go into, uh, let, let's look at the average cost of affordability and what people are making in different cities and, and what that looks like. And I believe you created an average, right? Absolutely. So a really good website, actually, call out careerbeacon.com. They've got a really good tab there. That's a salary tool calculator. It kind of goes over some of the average costs of uh, living all around Canada. So take it with a grain of salt. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't perfect, but it kind of paints a picture. And um, before I start rattling off some numbers here, I do want to talk about that this episode, we're going to be more or less just going high level, kind of talking about some of the numbers, what the average costs are in each city of Calgary, talk about a little bit, um, you know, about how that's affecting people. And then next episode, we're going to dive into a lot more detail about some of the true, um, what we feel to be some of the real reasons to actually tackle affordability. Do I have that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just kind of go into it here. So a salary um, in Calgary, like an average salary, uh, wow, an average <laughs> salary in Canada is about $54,450 per year. So we're looking at about twenty seven ninety two per hour gross income. So we do need to remember every time we talk about numbers, it's, it's either net or, or gross or net, right? Because that really does play a massive difference into some of these affordability things here. And, and by gross or net, he means pre or post tax. So exactly. we're, we're not, we're not, cutting off any type of other expenses like uh, groceries or you know electricity or anything like that so it's going to be what is what do you take home after the government takes their their portion absolutely so um i'm going to just kind of start with that like the average fifty four thousand dollars per year or a salary or an hourly salary of 27.92 gross okay so now the conversation goes what city um, sorry, what is a good salary in each city? And again, I would like to try and point out that what we're doing here is trying to encourage you to more or less look into your own financial situation, right? Especially if you're considering real estate as a primary residence or an investment, because these costs of living are very important, especially in this increasing environment of inflation, of interest rates, of all sorts of things that the middle class is, is kind of getting screwed over, right? I think we feel that way. I mean, in, in past podcasts, we've discussed, and I'm, I'm unsure if we're ever going to post those ones, but we discussed like the various policies that have been laid out. And it, it seems like um, most of them are targeted at uh, low income individuals, at risk individuals, which aren't terrible policies. Uh, don't get me wrong, but nothing's been really done with the exception of the tax free uh, first time home buyers savings program for the average Canadian. Mm from what I can see. I, I think that's probably fair to say. Um, Policy-wise, they, they've kind of gone on both ends of the of the spectrum as far as who they drunk the podcast for and the middle class are have just almost entirely been overlooked. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So with these numbers here, I'm just going to kind of give a brief overview of an annual salary of $60,000. I mean, if you're, if you're a working adult, I would say 30 plus, your goal is to try and get a minimum of $60,000, right? About $30 an hour. Mm. I think that's a pretty good achievement. I know a lot of people that are making more than that. I know some people making under that, but I would say $60,000 is, is a pretty good median, at least to shoot for. So when you look at Calgary, you know, $60,000 is actually $4,600 less than the average salary in Calgary. So the average salary in Calgary is 64,600. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a salary of $60,000 means that 
you'll be taking home about $45,000 per year after taxes or $3,800 per month to pay for things like housing, transportation, groceries, entertainment. Um, and then, um, yeah. So the average cost of living in Calgary, so says careerbeacon.com, is about $3,500 a month um, for an average salary of $60,000 a year. You're looking at about $3,800 per month. So you really only have $200 left over for whatever the heck you feel. Savings, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, it's still so, it's pretty tight. So I guess you super tight. You're either looking for some. This these are average costs. Super average, yeah. Yeah, so you're either looking for some alternative, you know, lower, whatever, lower rental mm -hmm. prices, lower car payments, uh, but you you really have to find a solution to save or find mm -hmm. another solution to earn in that particular case. But you're pretty you're pretty landlocked. Absolutely. And I do want to reiterate as well, like what we're trying to do here is build a foundation, right? Because I think that our podcasts are going to more or less build off of each other. So this podcast is kind of laying that foundation. So when in future podcasts, we talk about some of the things that can be done, we can reference this podcast by saying, yeah, this is kind of the boring mundane one where we talk about some of the averages in each city, because when you are looking at your own personal financial situation, it is good to know these numbers, right? Like, um, before I start diving into it, do you know what the averages are that CMHC has actually advised people spend, like percentage of their annual income on certain aspects so of its life? Up to the tippity top is going to be 39% of your gross debt servicing. So um, that would just be on your individual house. That's pre-tax income, 39% of it, uh, assuming that you have no other debts, mm -hmm. uh, can go towards the house itself. I believe with other debts, you can go up to 44% of GDS. Uh, so if you have a substantial student loan, we're talking like a 100K student loan, mm -hmm. uh, your ability to purchase a house just went way, 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 way down as far as the amount that they're going to lend you. Um, good idea to absolve those debts or at least absolve them in part before you start looking for um, a real estate purchase of any mm -hmm. kind. Um, of course, there's exceptions such as purchasing property through companies or uh, with added help and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I think if you had any questions resulting in those situations, uh, you can certainly just reach out to us uh, at the information provided at the end of this podcast. <laughs> I would uh, I would like to also bring up um, there's an article here from CreditCanada.com that was written in 2021, so a little bit out of date. But again, what is affordability in Canada, right? And this is trying to encourage you to do your own research on your personal situation. So they say about 35% in housing, um, sorry, 35% of your annual income or your monthly income, depending on how you want to break it down, should go towards housing. Your rent, um, your mortgage payment, your uh, utilities, stuff like that. Food, 15%. I think that's pretty fair. I like to eat out. I like to go to restaurants. I like to buy decent groceries. Mm. Transportation, about 15%. So again, we're talking for every $100, about $15. You're looking at you maybe your um, your gas payments, your insurance payments, your car payments, trying to stay within that 15%. Um, they do actually have a utilities here, which would be your monthly bill, so your phone bill, your landline, your cable, your Wi-Fi, your internet, all that jazz, about 10%. Debt payments, they have 10%. Personal discretionary, about 5%. Savings, 5%. Clothing, 25 And medical, 25 All equaling 100%. So... Do you have any discrepancies of that? Like, do you disagree with any of these statements here with just the percentages? I, I think they're all right. I mean, they're averages. Yeah, I mean, and there's tons of different savings programs that you can follow, but I think the thing that's shocking here is how they laid it out to be 100% of your total total income. You know, very little room for error in here. And I also found it really interesting when you're reading that off that um, if you read older literature around savings, it was 30% mm -hmm of your income should be going towards housing and then it crept up to 32 and now this was at 35 so it's still absolutely well cmhc hasn't really remeasured that 39 percent of gds in a very very long time as housing uh, prices have crept up larger and larger allowances have been given mm -hmm. to provide for your housing mm -hmm. and or to justify for your housing which i just found really interesting absolutely so funny that you say that. So I was talking to my uh, one of my favorite mortgage brokers, Joel Richards from the Qantas Mortgage Group, um, I, and he was saying that on average, you know, like two years ago, yeah, a lot of people were reaching that thirty five percent threshold. Where thirty once they hit thirty nine percent gross, mm -hmm. they basically can't qualify, right? And a lot of people, if not all, like I would say ninety to ninety five percent of people, are hitting that thirty nine percent, which is like the tippity top, like. 
they are stretching themselves to get into the housing market and people are just not slowing down man like that's when you start talking net like that's 50 percent of your net income going towards housing which is not sustainable at least not for the long term i mean hopefully they're we're going to talk about the reasons that what they could do to fix it but i mean that's pretty mind-blowing that 50 percent is going towards housing yeah not good i mean i think we're going to dive into that so that would be a great a great opportunity to pivot into the second section of this mm-hmm. podcast and we'll leave that for next week next week we want to talk a little bit more about some possible options and what would make it uh, or make it as in housing more affordable for that median working class mm-hmm. to afford Absolutely. and are there metrics that we can play with right now that would uh, create a more sustainable and long-lasting effect for these individuals to get into the market mm-hmm. um, understanding that the inability to get into the market um, is really going to create long-term a massive gap between those that have owned do own and you know own many 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 properties mm-hmm. right um so the next the next bracket that we're going to go into is this interesting topic around retirement so okay one thing that i've heard quite a bit is that there's going to be a mortgage cr- or a uh, housing correction it just has to happen and, and prices have to fall dramatically for that to occur and get all these people into the market so we're stepping away from what we really were speaking about there which is uh, affordability through uh, a median income earner trying to get into the market, which is really circled around a month to month payment. Mm-hmm. And we're going to the overall cost of a house. Um, being in Calgary right now, I believe it's $670,000. For a detached, yeah. For a detached. And so we'll use detached as the measurement. Now, detached are getting a little bit further and further away, especially as a first time purchaser from able to get into that product type. And so we're not necessarily suggesting that in order for housing to become affordable, just detached have to become affordable. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're just looking at that overall price because that's typically what's being sold in this particular case. So if we had a massive correction, I would make the argument that uh, it would actually have a more devastating effect that for whatever reason, a retirement pro- uh, policy that seemed to be adopted across Canada, and I'd say I've probably had a dozen calls this week on individuals looking to make this transition or individuals that purchase their family home and they're looking to sell their family home and downsize or rent or whatever their, you know, whatever their, their personal position is, is allowing them to do. And that sale of their property and the appreciated value plus sweat equity is now making up a large sum, if not over half of their retirement savings mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. If we saw a huge correction starting in 2024, so I apologize my dog's barking here. Um, if we saw a huge correction in 2024 of home prices, say go down 25%, I would make the argument that Canada is not prepared with their pension plan or otherwise to support that difference. Mm-hmm. And what does that have as far as an impact on our overall GDP um, and consumer spending nationwide? It's it's a uh, a group that holds, uh, I believe it's the largest uh, householding group or property owning group across Canada. And uh, over half of their net worth is tied up into the family home. Mm-hmm. I found an interesting article that I think we can discuss a little further on the, uh, the Globe and Mail. And this is actually from two years ago. This is from 2021 um, that made a uh, an argument that uh, towards selling your home and renting into retirement and the benefits of having that. Mm. So uh, taking away the risk of ownership and the overhead of ownership. So they gave an example of a couple, um, Brenda and Bruce. Uh, <laughs> nice. Excellent names. Love uh, that. They Love downsided that. Uh, from their 2,700 square foot home in Ontario and moved to Vancouver Island. And they've been bouncing between properties uh, for the last couple of years, but they, they overall seem happy. Um, within this article, uh, Sun Life did a survey and they found that 40% of working Canadians believe that they're at risk of outliving their savings. Nearly half, 44%. Uh, expect to be working full time until the age of 65. And so essentially this article is making uh, the argument that you can sell your family home and move to some other type of um, living lifestyle. So either downsizing substantially or renting uh, and then uh, live further off instead of trying to keep your large family home and keeping up with the property taxes and utilities and, and so on and so forth. I would also note before I throw this in your direction that they all the same Globe and Mail then released a, let's see the difference here. Nine months later, released another article stating, now more than ever, owning a home is not a retirement plan. Mm. Um, so I think they walked back that uh, that article, yeah. that article yeah, a little bit. That might have seen some backlash. But w- what are your thoughts on that? So if, if housing corrects, 
right? And we see a 20, let's say, say for example, a 25% dump in home values. Mm -hmm. This would essentially mean in this particular case, a 25% reduction in many people's retirement savings program. Mm -hmm. And some are at the age that they're actually looking to retire. Mm -hmm. And we have a bulk, a baby boomer population that's just entering the retirement yep. or they've been retiring for a while, but they haven't finished the retirement process quite yet. How are we affected? It seems like that median income or struggling to get into a house right now is now into a house, but they're going to be what paying higher taxes, paying into a pension program at a higher rate. Uh, what are we going to be doing to support this aging population that for whatever reason, there was this policy that you could own a family home, you see this massive appreciation and it makes up over your, over half of your retirement mm -hmm. savings. Oh, Andrew, I don't even know how to reply to it's, that. To it's be quite a catch 22, yeah, isn't it? it? Right. Yeah. So it's, it's wishful thinking. I think, uh, some in the next episode, I think that we'd present some policy that maybe could, that's valid. It, it could see a benefit to both. Yeah. I, I think, um, wishing for a 25% downturn, um, you know, whether you're looking in your own backyard and you just don't care, it'll ultimately affect you. It's mm -hmm. going to affect the economy. Um, and, and it will certainly will affect your taxes. I would assume I just don't, mm -hmm. don't imagine how else we would, uh, how else we would sub subsidize that lifestyle. Um, hmm. okay. I think that's, um, I think that's super valid now. Um, I, I really don't have much to add to that, to be honest with you. I think that that's a really good point. Do you want to continue to chat about um, some of the like average costs or not the costs, sorry, maybe like go back to the incomes or do you want to continue to drive down that that hole that you're kind of digging there? The, hell, the, <laughs> the retirement section. No, yeah. I think we can circle around it. I mean, okay. I, I think this was generally an overview podcast. Um, and good valid point just... though. There's a lot of debt. There's a lot of people. I, I, I wish I looked up the stat because I know it's insane how much debt there is um, in Canada. And there was actually an article that came out for our CIBC and how a lot of their mortgages are actually negative assets for them. Mm. And I think they're pretty high up there. I don't know the exact numbers and I wish I looked that up beforehand, but I think we're gonna see a lot of waves going on in the, in the five big banks in Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's been a finance centric podcast here, but um... I mean, I can't speak across all of Canada. I'm, I'm sure there's some examples in, in Vancouver and Toronto, but in Calgary, housing has been built at least since the 50s on the back of private investment and construction in um, Canada is financed. Mm. And I would say that it is a very enveloping statement. So um, enveloping, unsure if that's a word. If it's not, I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, so with, with raising rates here in, in the inability really for uh, the creation of mass supply uh, it goes both ways mm -hmm. individuals can afford a house builders can't afford to build tons and tons of houses we're at a little bit of a stalemate retirees can't necessarily afford for houses to drop so the part of the plan was this you know houses will never drop and and the cushion and the 25 percent cushion in retirement savings mm -hmm. uh, would be very difficult to recover for them assuming that you're you know my math's probably not correct there. So 25% drop in home value, assuming that the house is worth 50% of their, so that would be a 12.5% reduction in retirement savings. Still substantial. Um, I, Pretty big deal, man. I mean, I think we've got a lot of interesting things to yeah, cover here. Forward. Yeah, there's, there's, again, this is more of like a high level of trying to set it up for the future. And I think you've actually laid it out pretty well there. I, I like how you talked about, you know, the retirees really can't afford it. Yeah. Right. So like who, who's going to get screwed over the most, right? Is it the people that can't afford to buy the houses? Is it the people that put all their investments into housing? Like someone's got to lose here. Right. And I don't think there's a middle ground because I, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a pretty nice correction. Nice is like as a kind of a, uh, what would you say that a sarcastic statement, but like a, a pretty decent sized correction in the next few years, because when you start to look at the average incomes, you start to look at the average price. And you start to look at all of the people that are moving here. Like it, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the Canadian economic scene right now. Yeah. And I suppose how long will that correction occur? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the next episode, we're going to talk about a couple different options. Will we talk about 40 year amortizations coming back? Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, will we talk about uh, potential reductions in interest rates for construction lending and GST removal? Most likely. Um, are we going to talk about blanketing political uh, stunts that people are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll try to avoid those topics, but for the moment, 
Uh, I hope we set the stage for the next episode. Absolutely. Talk about the potential mm -hmm. opportunities that can be taken and, and maybe some ideas on how um, housing could be affordable or more affordable in mm -hmm. Canada. We want to look at it from two lenses, just like we did today, being uh, the more entry level, which isn't necessarily focused too much on the overall price, but rather on the month to month value and maybe a solution for that demographic while protecting the retirement and the, the selling side of things that are looking for that overall price because they have deeper equity, uh, both sweat equity and appreciation built into their homes and what solutions for them could be um, as we move forward into the market, maybe a gradual reduction in price or if prices are just going to stay this way uh, long term. Hmm. Well, what is affordability in Canada? Well, it's pretty screwed up right now. So we're going to try and unravel this as the best we can. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that's, I think yeah. that's really about it. I think it was ex excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, kind of laying the idea. foundation. That's all we're doing. So again, we're a new podcast here. Thank you for all the family and friends that are basically the only ones watching this till the end. <laughs> so thank you it so will get, watching. it will get better. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers.